Welcome to Old Heads New Thoughts. This is Ken Shropshire. I'm here with my longtime colleague, friend, Bill Roden. Bill, how are you today? Ken, all good. You know, summertime, I'm in, I'm, I'm happy as a lark. <laughs> <laughs> as they say, I, I don't know what. I don't know how a lark feels, but <laughs> I'm as happy as a lark. <laughs> could, be, could it be any happier than that? And, and today we have a special guest, Katie Barnes, um, for, first timer on the show. Glad, glad to have you here with us. Thanks for having me. Really pumped to be here. So, so today we're certainly going to, uh, we're in the midst of the NBA playoffs, so we're going to have a little commentary on that at, at the end. But in the true spirit of old heads, new thoughts, we've got old heads that are seeking to be up to speed, making wise decisions, wise commentary, and to help any other old heads out there to do the same, especially on this issue of, of transgender athletes. And uh, Katie has a, a, a book coming out that I'm looking forward to to seeing to to further educate and we'll we'll talk about that some. But you know the big issue that you know, on this show we talk about a lot of a lot about access and opportunity. And for some reason this is a space where where people seem to fall short in that discussion and understanding what the issues are and how to provide equal access and opportunity. Um, uh, to uh, to a group of, of 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 humans in a way that we've had to march through this whole kind of understanding of the world on on other issues. So, um, Katie's going to, with the the assist of our uh, old head questions, <laughs> going to help us to help you better understand these issues. I was joking not get, with, with not get you know, fired. <laughs> what's that? And not get fired. <laughs> yeah. Well, well I, was joking, I was joking with Bill um, as, as we were preparing for the show about the issue of being in the first grade on, in understanding an issue and when to have the appropriate kinds of conversations to advance yourself beyond the first grade uh, to, to get, a, get a doctorate or, or you know, whatever the highest level is on something. So uh, in that regard, yeah, Bill said, well, you know, probably a lot of other people in the first grade too. So let's just ask those kinds of kinds of questions. But but Katie, what, you, you know, if you don't mind, let's let's start off. And you focused a a, a lot kind of the, your public uh I guess public uh I want to say immersion or or major display in the press and like was around the Connecticut case, you know, I guess that's now two, three years ago, and, and that's the focus of your book. Uh, why, why don't you talk some about how that case was so important to to elevate the issues that people are grappling with more more and more now? And also, as, as Bill said, that um, it have brought people to the reality of, oh no, no, you really do have to deal with understanding and making big decisions. Obama, Trump, Biden administration, state legislators about the opportunities and access for transgender athletes. But Katie, if you, if you could just give us kind of an overview of, of, of that case, and then, then we can kind of move from there. Yeah, so I think one thing to understand about policy as it pertains to transgender athletes is that other than you know, recent policy recommendations from the Biden administration, like there is no federal law about this. There is no federal policy that exists that governs all eligibility criteria across all high school associations. And so each high school association, um, they're named different things, uh, sets their own policy. And in April, well, yeah, I guess in April of 2017, um, you know, Connecticut uh, has a, had a policy, and they still do have this policy that allowed for um, transgender athletes, no matter what sex they were assigned at birth, to participate in school sports based on their gender identities 
without requiring medical or legal intervention. And so what I mean by that is that there was no surgical requirement, which is outside the standards of care for minors to begin with. Uh, there was no like name change requirement or birth certificate requirement um, or a hormone requirement, so on. If the school district and the school districts were um, in charge of deciding what team or category was appropriate for an athlete to participate in. So that is how the Connecticut policy functioned. Now, each high school association has their own policy, some of which look similar, some of which look different. Um, and at this point in time, there was no law, really, like le the legislative efforts had not happened yet in terms of overriding a state high school association's existing policy or really making this about what a state legislature was going to do um, to regulate uh, gender eligibility for school sports. That was not really a thing in 2017. And so Andrea Yearwood, uh, who at the time was a freshman, um, began running in the girls category in track and field. And she is transgender. And that was made public uh, by the, you know, she did a story with the Hartford Current. And really her freshman season, there wasn't that much of an uproar. It was pretty quiet. Um, I followed her for pretty much that entire season. Um, and it was very New England. I live in Connecticut. So like I could sense that there was some, like not everybody was on board, but you know, people weren't shouting at her in the stands or anything like that. At the same time, I was also covering a young athlete out of Texas and he was getting shouted at in the stands. Um, so that was a little bit different. But with Andrea, you know, she won a state, a state championship in her class. So for track and field, Connecticut does class size categories. She competed in class size S for small schools, won a state championship um, in an event there. And then qualified for the state open, did not win any state championships at the state open. The following season, the following outdoor season, and so this is spring of 2018, um, a young woman by the name of Terry Miller, who's also transgender, started running in Connecticut in the girls category, and Terry was faster. <laughs> um, and Terry did win state op the state open, she set a state open record. Uh, she won New England that, that year in both the 100 and the 200 meter. Um, and, uh, you know, there were different times over the course of the next two seasons where Andrea and Terry would go one, two at state um, in various, in like various race, uh, race events. Um, and that was when people started to get a little upset within the state. And so, there was uh, there were a couple of petitions out of a school district in Glastonbury, uh, looking to have the policy amended or have them suspended from participation. Um, the summer of 2019, um, the Alliance Defending Freedom uh, filed a Title IX complaint on behalf of um, a number of cisgender girls in the state of Connecticut, most of whom were unnamed at that time, but there was one who was named, uh, Selena Soul. And basically saying that the Connecticut policy is in violation of Title IX. Okay, and the Department of Education reviewed the complaint. Um, but then the following February, so this all happened also right around the time that Idaho filed the first successful bill that looked to restrict transgender girls uh, from participating in girls' sports at the school level, which was worked on behind the scenes by ADF. And so within a day of each other, ADF filed a lawsuit on February 12th um, in Connecticut that was a federal lawsuit challenging the uh, policy on Title IX grounds. And the next day, um, HB 500 was filed in Idaho. And so for over the course of 2020, through that legislative session into 2021, which was the first big legislative session that saw multiple bills that looked like Idaho's HB 500 being filed and passed across the country, Connecticut was the case that was often pointed to. So, Katie, let, let, let me ask you ask you this as, as we go through. I mean, this is very recent history in the, mm -hmm. in the realm of things. And, and I should have asked this initially. Is, is there uh, an earlier historic moment where 
the transgender issue had emerged in such a, a public way, or is, is it really in terms of these types of discussions, partic participation discussions? Well, I mean, I think the most famous instance of a trans person participating in sports at a high level is Renee Richards um, in the late 70s, participating right. um, you know, on the women's tennis tour. Um, and so like that happened. And when Renee Richards actually was participating and competing on the tour, you know, there's coverage, you know, saying that you know, women's right. sports is going to end and all of these things. Uh, we know that that did not happen, but you know, there was pushback at, in the moment as well, no, although she did sue for her ability to compete and was granted that. Th this is, this is great for a, uh, whole head stake in the ground in, ter in terms of, um, anybody that's trying to figure out, well, wait a minute, where, how long has this issue been, been with us? And I, I just sidebar, we always give important information. My wife, who was a professional tennis player, was Renee Richards' doubles partner mm -hmm. uh, for, for a period of time. Um, Very my, interesting. My wife is the best athlete in the family. Other, <laughs> well, my son would compete with that, but that's a whole nother <laughs> little side, sidebar commentary there. I love that. <laughs> well, so, but I think and, you know, and so I mentioned Renee Richards because there is historical precedent for the existence of these conversations. Right. But really, when we're talking about the modern discussion that we're having right now in terms of the various entities that are involved, the stories that are often pointed to, um, it really starts with, I would say, 2017 with both Andrea Yearwood running in Connecticut and Mac Beggs competing and winning a girl state championship in Texas in wrestling. And Mac Beggs is a transgender boy um, and he won. And because of a particular confluence of policy, um, he was required to wrestle in the girls category in Texas. And Texas is one of a handful of states that has a girls category in wrestling. Most states do not. And so he was wrestling um, against girls while also medically transitioning. Uh, so he was taking testosterone at the time and he won back-to-back -back state championships when undefeated his junior and senior season. Um, and that was also a really hot button issue uh, because in 2017, uh, Texas um, has an every other year legislature and it's in season, well, they are convening during odd years. And so 2017 was um, a legislature year and Mac Beggs played pretty heavily in that as they considered different bills that would have uh, restricted transgender youth in schools in different ways, as well as, you know, a so-called bathroom bill at that time. So there was kind of a lot going on. Um, and then also the Obama administration was involved in terms of um, recommend publishing a Dear Colleague letter in May of 2016 that had different recommendations for how to be in compliance with Title IX in terms of treating transgender students in schools, uh, including athletics, basically saying you have to let trans kids play sports, and 23 states sued. So there was like a lot happening at different levels, really beginning in 2016 into 2017. And, and, and the, the other, if I'm not mistaken, if, so the other big difference is I think Renee Richards was a 40-something year old man that that wanted to compete and and uh, against women who were you know prime age tennis players at the time. So so you you know if you were trying to find justification in your mind, if you had some some issues with that, the, the age differential came into play. Today we're talking about this true access issue at the time uh, when you want to be yourself at the at at the prime time in your life. To compete in with the uh, with the gender you want, where you want to compete, so it's a little differential in this, and and that's a lot of what we're seeing. I'm on Penn's campus, so the the Leah Thomas swimmer issues is one. Yeah. That, uh, I also I also think another key difference is the is the type of competition that we're talking about, mm -hmm. and these things often get conflated, right? Even we're talking about Leah Thomas as it pertains to school sports. Like, yes, we are talking about athletes who are looking to compete with their, with their similarly aged peers. That is happening. And also we're talking about athletes who by and large are very young and are students wanting to compete in school level sports. Right. Uh, there are of course instances, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this, 
where we are talking about college or we're talking about division one, there are a handful of those, but the overwhelming majority of legislation um, and of where this issue is really being talked about from a Title IX perspective is we're talking about K-12 sports. Yeah, you know, um, we, we talked, uh, you know, we met uh, Katie at the Women's Final Four. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, and we, we talked about a lot of stuff, but what fascinates me is that there seems to be this coming war. I think mo what most people hear every day is how one state legislature after another, mostly in red states, are passing these uh, these uh, laws preventing trans athletes from competing. Uh, and I think as you correctly pointed out, the reason why this is happening is that there is no federal legislation. I, I mean, I think that, you know, like the Biden administration has basically danced around the issue of transgender athletes. Very clear that transgender students should be affirmed but it's kind of danced around this issue of transgender athletes. And I wonder what you, why is that? Why has that been such a, a, delicate, a delicate dance um, that, the, that while these states are kind of doing everything they want to do, uh, the administration has not really dr driven a stake in the ground about athletes. Yes, students, but not athletes. Well, and you know, to be clear, as a sports reporter, I don't always, I, I don't have very much reported insight into what's going on with the Biden administration. But what I will say about it is I think the issue is very hard. Like it's just incredibly challenging. And also what we know from recent history is that there will be litigation. So the Biden administration has come out with a proposed set of regulations explicitly on Title IX as it pertains to transgender athletes. And they are trying to thread a very specific needle. It's very small, um, where they where the administration has said these blanket bans that we are seeing in um I, not just predominantly red states, all red states. Like when it comes to this particular issue, whether we're talking about transgender athletes or we're talking about transgender youth, it is by and large a partisan issue. Uh, where one side is very animated on this topic and the other side uh, is not particularly. Um, and so we've seen that in the, you know, roughly 20-ish states that have passed restrictions on trans athletes specifically. So what the Biden administration is proposing through this regulatory change, which is very technical, <laughs> it's, it's not new legislation, it's not um, an amendment to Title IX, it is an I don't know how much in the weeds you want to get, but essentially in 1972, when Title IX was passed and acted into law, it's just, you know, these 37 words in an omnibus education bill. And then in 1975, they sat down and hashed out all of these regulations uh, to put into law through, in terms of how, what it meant to be in compliance with Title IX and how Title IX would be regulated. Um, and so what the Biden administration is proposing is a shift in those regulations. And that proposal essentially says that blanket bans on transgender athletes competing are not appropriate and are out of step with Title IX. And if you want to restrict a transgender girl in particular from playing girl sports, that policy cannot be just, oh, well, she was assigned male at birth, she is transgender, therefore she can't compete. It has to be a more compelling argument than that. If you are going to make such an argument that hinges on a quote unquote fairness or quote unquote prevention of injury, then those arguments have to be more compelling than just, well, she's trans. Um, and so it's very complex. Um, that's about as distilled as I can get it. The document itself is 116 pages for a three sentence regulatory change, um, but it is a very tough issue. And a lot of people have very strong feelings on many sides of it. Um, and I think from a governmental policy space, it's just, it's hard to pass any kind of 
um, regulation change or take any kind of position that then doesn't w- ultimately wind up in the courts. Yeah. And, you know, what? what's also fascinating to me, I mean, this was, at least NCA has called this year the 50th anniversary of Title IX. I mean, technically it's not, but it, it seems, what seems to me is that the opponents of transgender athletes' participation are basically weaponizing Title IX, which is the greatest flip. They're basically weaponizing Title IX against transgender athletes, saying they're putting themselves on the side of protecting women. And I, I guess, and you put it like that, it, it seems like what this boils down to is the question for Title IX is what does it mean to be discriminated against on the basis of sex? And does that include transgender people? Um, and it, I think this is the question you pose. Is it sex-based discrimination to say to a transgender girl who was assigned male at birth that she is not allowed to compete in girl sports because girl sports are for those assigned female at birth? And, you know, you've heard governor after governor of the state saying, you know, you're born a boy, that's what you are. So it just seems like those, that's kind of like the core. It seems like a simple issue, but how do you how do you get to that? I mean, you, you know what I'm saying? Well, it's incredibly complex, right? Because ultimately we're deciding, or the questions that are being asked are, they, they seem like they're simple, right? Like what does sex-based discrimination mean? What does it mean to be a woman? How do you define womanhood? What does it mean to be a man? What are the physiological differences between sexes? Like these are very simple, open-ended questions that we should be able to answer. And yet they're very complex. I think it depends on where a person sits in terms of the values that they hold and what they believe to be true. And for a lot of people, what they believe to be true, regardless of whether or not I believe it's true, or science believes it's true, like what they believe to be true is that if you're assigned male at birth, you have physiological advantages that are immutable and therefore an unfair advantage if you are competing in in girls and women's sports. Um, Or put more simply that essentially any person who's assigned male at birth is a better athlete than any person assigned female at birth in all circumstances in perpetuity. And I would say that scientifically it's more complicated than that, Um, but also that just from a cultural perspective, we know that that is not true, right? right? Like, and a lot of times I think in this conversation, we're having many, many conversations at once, which means we're having a conversation about elite sports, about college sports, about high school sports, about elementary sports. And then there's all of these policy layers on top of that from, you know, the Olympic committee to the state legislature, to the federal government, to your local um, policies, to whoever it is that's governing your club sports outside of your school apparatus, right? So all of this is happening simultaneously, which is how I think you get, we get to a place where conversationally, to justify a restriction that extends all the way down into elementary school sports and all the way up to intramural college sports, you have legislators pointing to Leah Thomas as the reason why that needs to happen. Well, okay, but like, you know, Leah Thomas swimming at the University of Pennsylvania has, and uh, the stakes of a college championship are not reflective of seven-year-old t-ball, right? Like we can all agree that those are two very different things. But colloquially, that's not how we are having that discussion. And also those delineations and allowances are not being made by legislation. And in fact, legislation is going out of its way to be as broad as possible in terms of the specific enumerations of the types of sports and schools it will restrict. And so that's how we end up with policy that is this broad by law uh, as to affect as many schools and as many sporting experiences as possible, regardless of whether or not it would be scientifically appropriate to do so. I I guess as as part of the uh, old head kind of dilemma, even, even if you get that far, that it's different for kids, I mean, 
those of us who uh, our parents have and have had kids involved in the youth sports, you you know at five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve years old, you don't know who the best athlete is. Mm -hmm. That 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 whatever kind of um, stigma you have in your head about who's better at what, you you're gonna you're gonna be surprised at some point by somebody winning a competition, a girl being a boy, or, or whatever it might be. And I'm wondering if, if if that can be can that be accepted? I think I think the Biden administration just said you, you can't do a carte blanche, you can't have a blanket rule. Although it's you know it's, it's a policy statement, it's not not legislation saying that uh, advisory. But is is that is that the first step? Is that a, a first possible step to begin to think like that? To think we need to think about how nuanced the situations are, or I and think. I think, and I think, as I say that, I think part of the, if if I can think of the concerns of those who are absolutely not, this this can't happen. Um, they are thinking about extreme circumstances that are uh, primarily of these elite athletes, and you know, if you got, uh, yeah, you know, the the greatest male swimmer of all time swimming in college against um, women swimmers and and they can't get their head around the possibilities of that but they can't separate that out from from youth sports is is, is there a path that gets you to to begin to think of the nuances I think so I think that's ultimately what the Biden administration is trying to do yeah. with its regulation proposals um, is to force a more nuanced conversation that also is a more rational one. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, I grew up in a small town, Indiana, like a really small town, about 1400 people. And everybody in Indiana plays basketball, right? Like I grew up playing basketball, like really everybody plays it. And when there was a D1 player on the court, you knew it, you know, like you just knew it. And there are so many examples of that where you know, you as your tiny town are, you know, going to play a bigger school in the city and they've just got three D1 kids and they wipe the floor with you, right? Like there are all kinds of examples of outliers in local sports and in school sports um, that affect outcome um, in ways that I don't think we talk about. Like, and so what I mean by that is, oh, uh, you know, in addition to, you know, those little stories, they, you know, there's some really good research that's actually come out of a local paper in Connecticut that breaks down state championships um, by school district. And the schools that typically win state championships are the more affluent schools, they're the schools with resources, right? And so, you know, we don't often talk about the influence of money in sport as being of a particular advantage. And the reality is, is that we like to, I think, think about sports culturally as the ultimate meritocracy, right? right. That, you know, so-and-so is discovered like Jimmy from Hoosiers because he could just hit shot after shot, you know, at his peach basket barn hoop, right? And that that is going to then lift that person out of poverty and into glory and riches et cetera, et cetera, right? And usually those stories come from Black students, actually, right? Like those are the stories that we gravitate toward. And, but ultimately, like, that's not how sports work, right? There are also so many stories of basketball players with elite athlete lineage. And there are stories of swimmers with elite athlete lineage. There are stories of um, athletes who you know, pay for quarterback coaches when they're 12. And we accept those advantages because we've deemed those advantages to be acceptable. And so then what has happened is when we talk about something that is so complex physiologically and scientifically, it's like we're not able to really grasp you know, all of these differences and what this means. And because a person is assigned male at birth, like, their advantage is somehow insurmountable. When also in reality, we know that you have to be good at the sport too, 
right? Like just because so-and-so jumps high doesn't mean they're a great volleyball player or a great basketball player, et cetera, et cetera. That might be a great high jumper, but you still have to have technique to do that, right? So I think in general, what, at least what I try to do in this space is to complicate it, which then hopefully will allow us to simplify it. And then we can recomplicate it again if people want to do that. But I think in general, we're just so wrapped up in the cultural simplicity of the argument that boys shouldn't play girl sports. And that's really driving a lot of this conversation. When in reality, we're not actually talking about boys or, you know, and people will play on that imagery by using the phrase biological males. And it's like, okay, yes, a transgender girl is assigned male at birth. But at what point, like, but exactly what are we talking about when it comes to determining a person's sex? Because each and every one of the factors that create our sex is very complicated to just key in on as the sole determining factor. And that's a really hard conversation to have. It requires a deep interest in having that conversation. And I don't really think culturally we've been there. So I do think we are getting we are getting there because there is a general understanding. I think once people actually look at the legislation that has passed as it has written, I think folks in general are kind of like, oh, well, intramural collegiate volleyball is not the same thing as competitive division one collegiate volleyball. Like we could admit that. And intramural collegiate volleyball is not the same thing as club volleyball or volleyball for seven, eight-year-olds when you just start. Like we can all admit that the stakes there are different. So maybe we should have a different conversation instead of a one size fits all. And I think we're we're actually starting to get there, though it has taken years of difficulty to do so. Yeah. How long, uh, the, the two thoughts, one thought and a question. Uh, it seems like It seems like the fear of a trans athlete uh, I think a man masquerading as a woman is that's one of the that's one of the the, the ongoing tropes of, of women's basketball and I think you really haven't you know at the final four I asked um I'm blanking on her name uh the LSU head coach yeah Kim Mulkey um, Kim, which you can almost predict <laughs> you know where you know what she says publicly but she even proposed like having a separate category <laughs> there should be a separate category you know like that's going to kind of solve the issue, but um, how you 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 you've written a book, uh, which is congratulations coming out I guess in September. Uh, mm -hmm, thank you about the Connecticut thing. It's just really great. Uh, but how long do you think in the next five, ten years, if you look back on almost any type of trend, things that that drove people up a wall forty years ago are now, you know, accepted. Uh, how long do you think this may take, given the complexity of it, uh, given the nuance, how long do you think this may take to play off? Like you, right now you got this war of state legislatures taking on the federal government, but how long do you think this is going to take to kind of play itself out? Oh, I think many, many, many years. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is that Yes, the and because of the political dynamics of the issue, um, there, you know, the, eventually, states they will have run out of states to pass such legislation in. Um, however, <laughs> um, I know for a fact that you know that there is interest in a federal ban um, on trans girls playing girls sports, like on restrictions at the federal level. Um, both from interviews that I've done with ADF representation in the past, but also, you know, the House of Representatives passed a very passed a bill itself. Now, the Democratic Senate will not take it up and Biden would veto it if they did. But our political dynamics and realities change. And so if there is a change, there will likely be an appetite uh, to revisit that legislation. Whether or not it will be successful, I don't know. But that's not off the table, and that is um, that that is something uh, that certain entities would like to see. Uh, so there's that. But also is that once this legislation is on the books, 
the only way it can be rolled back is either through repeal or through court cases. Um, and I don't know what our Supreme Court would say about a case like this as it pertains to Title IX and of the legality of such legislation. Um, that would be very interesting. There are a couple of cases that may make their way to the Supreme Court, but barring a Supreme Court ruling that would vacate all of this legislation, rendering it unconstitutional, each state would have to repeal it. And as we saw in North Carolina repealing HB2, um, post and they passed that law in 2016, and it was partially repealed in 2017, it took a Herculean effort to get a partial repeal. Um, the amount of effort and money and organizing power it would take to roll back this legislation all across the country would be considerable, unlike anything we've ever seen, honestly. So I'm pessimistic that that would happen. Uh, but then also, you know, at the international level, we're seeing federations go through a massive change in the types of policies that they are enacting. And that's going to filter down through national governing bodies. It's going to filter down through club uh, rules um, as it affects youth who are participating in sports outside of schools and in these more competitive club systems. So we're going to see this issue is going to be with us for a very long time. Uh, especially because there is such little agreement on not just what policy is appropriate, but even like what it is that we're talking about to begin with and what would be fair to begin with. Um, you know, we, there, the sides on the topic don't really agree on the fundamental underlying facts, and that becomes a very hard place to start negotiating policy from. Hey, Bill, uh, I'm going to ask you the same question. Uh, how, how long do you think it will take? Huh. You know, <laughs> I have no idea. I, I, I guess my only, I can't put a name, I, I can't put a uh, time limit on it, but I guess my the source of my faith that things will shake out is looking at all other trends. You know, uh, Black folks couldn't vote. Women didn't have the vote. Uh, things that terrified people uh, you know, over time, attitudes soften, reality sets in. Uh, and right now you've got this civil war about, you know, a certain group of people cannot compete. So I don't know. I mean, I, like, I can't say, is it going to be 20 years from now, 30 years from now, you know, maybe 30 years from now, um, we'll see some common kind of commonality. But I think one of the things that um, uh, you mentioned, Katie, is that I guess what's sort of bizarre about this is that the federal government, the stance depends on who's in office. You know, you mentioned mm -hmm. the Obama White House uh, had his stance, which was overturned by the Trump White House, which was overturned by the Biden White House. So now who knows what's going to happen? You know, so it's almost like it, it, it comes and goes depending on who's in power. So to that extent, you're right. It could take, it could take, uh, it could take decades. But I, I, all I can say, Ken, is answer your specific question is offer you a journalistic generality <laughs> that you know that we shall we shall overcome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I may not be there with you, <laughs> Dr. King. I may not get there with you. <laughs> but I know what's we're the, the people. <laughs> what's the, the brown brown versus board language with with all deliberate speed? Yeah, we're, we're still speeding along since fifty five. I, I just want from, from from Katie's perspective. I just want it to be a hot issue. So when your book comes out, you'll be it'll be a bestseller, and <sighs> you will be in demand because you're the only person who can really explain. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. Uh, in that sense, I am quite confident. That in September we'll still be talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. <laughs> well, 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 Katie, you you've been uh, been very kind in uh, walking old heads through this, and, and certainly our, I'm sure our listeners appreciate it as well. And uh, unfortunately, from the the social standpoint, but fortunately for us in terms of you, we we we're going to have to have you come come back and, and help us further along. As this issue moves along, especially when once your your book comes out, we definitely want to have you back. You got to come back awesome. when the book comes out. Yeah. I will definitely do that. I promise. All right. Thank you, Katie.
Thank you. I appreciate you both. Thanks, Katie. You're great. Bill, you, you feel as though I'm, uh, I'm, in, I'm in the second grade now, that I've, I've had my full primer? Yeah, yeah, actually, it was very good, Ken. I think we're going to give you a double. You know? <laughs> Instead of you just going to be in fourth grade, we're going to put you in fifth grade. No, so I'll tell you, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm making light of it, but but the idea of the, the nuanced treatment and the way you have to especially the age group piece that you, you've got to, especially kids. I mean, why, why are we putting this, it's on kids? And that does push it to more to the parents to, in whatever decision they make with, with their child or, or unilaterally, I guess parents can do that too. Um, that's going to, at least in terms of what the Biden administration seems to be alluding to, that's where the decision can be made. And, and there's not the competitive problem. It sounds like if it, at the, the older levels, that the issue of competitive advantage, and so it's so funny how often that comes up in sports, that issue of competitive advantage comes into play. And we haven't figured out how to incorporate that into the conversation when it still comes to uh, access and, and participation at, at these higher up levels. Yeah, well, you know, a, a, again, you know, you've had, you know, uh, you know, children who've competed. And, uh, you know, those are, you know, we, we parents go nuts. You know, yeah. parents go nuts if they think that somebody else has an advantage, an advantage over their child. So you could imagine the irrational conversations around this if all of a sudden your child is competing against a trans woman and, and wins, you know, and that becomes the reason why your kid loses, you know. So I, I think that's why this conversation is so heated, particularly at the youth level, because parents lose their mind. Without this conversation, parents lose their mind, you know, when their kids don't do as well as they think. And when they think that somebody else has an unfair advantage, you know, could be, you know, you see it with just because majority, you know, majority, you bring a black basketball player into your club, you know, into your neighborhood, and maybe the athlete doesn't live in the neighborhood, you know, all of that's unfair. You know, you're bringing in ringers. So, you know, to add this level to it, um, I think adds a level of emotionalism that's irrational. So, uh, yeah, I agree with Katie. I I, I think it, it will eventually get there, but I think right now it's just so, it's politics and emotion. Uh, this has become a key part of the cultural war, yet another appendage of the, of the cultural war. I thought what she said was great too. I, mean, I know that's another segment. Matter of fact, that segment may lead into our last discussion about the owner of the uh, Phoenix Suns, when she talked about the, the role that money plays, you right. know, money plays in somebody's uh, uh, success in sports, you yeah, know. Exactly, yeah, you, know, you have access to the golf training or the tennis oh, oh. training or the, the, uh, the private trainer starting at age five. Hitting coach, the fielding yeah. coach, the quarterback oh, yeah, yeah. The, the, so, so there's, there's a lot of work to do in sports in terms of of advantage that that you've got bigger bigger hands and feet, or all the, all those sorts of things that can come into play. And, and as as we know, you you can't coach height, so which right. gets us to uh, in in our last uh, kind of couple of minutes here. We've both been watching these these NBA playoffs, which which have been really good. I mean, just just in terms of the teams that are involved and. and Kind of the new level of players, and then you still got you know the the, the Curry Lebron thing going, so you get some of the, the old time stuff too. But yeah, you mentioned the the, the Matt Ishbia moment. As, as we're recording this, there there there's not been a, a final determination on, on on the incident. But but you brought it up. You got some thoughts. Why don't, why don't you why don't you tell us what you think about the uh, uh, in the stands encounter that uh, the owner of the Phoenix Suns had. Yeah, I'm not sure what to make of it yet. Like I said, by the time people hear this, uh, either um, Jokic will either be suspended or not. We know who's not going to get suspended. <laughs> <laughs> That's the owner of the team. They kind of figure out now. I'm sure I'd love to hear those conversations. How do we, how do we make this decision without making the right decision that involves the owner of the team? You know, so they're, they're, they they can't follow the truth where it leads. But particularly if it leads to Ishbia, they say, well, no, 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 no. That's not the outcome we want. But, but when you look at this, and the guy holds the ball, you know, he's he's clearly holding on to the ball. 
and Jokic goes over there. You know, you you've been on the playground, right, Ken, with somebody. You've even seen it in a regular game. Like you'll score a basket, and and one guy will hold the ball, and the player will come in and snatch the ball because they want to hurry up and play. So he wanted to take the ball from this damn fan, and maybe Jokic just thought there's another white guy sitting, a privileged guy sitting courtside. Well, he's right. He is a privileged guy sitting courtside. He just is real privileged. <laughs> You know, <laughs> before, I, before I press you to have a uh, Nostradamus moment and and figure out what what is going to be decided on this, you know, I I still have a very different interpretation than than I'm hearing from a lot of people. I I didn't think either one of them knew what was going on in the moment. I certainly didn't think Ishbia was trying to do anything. I mean, I think, I think the man was just kind of stunned in the oh, I got the ball. You got the ball. I, 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 just, it was, it was, it was so, so wham bam. So it went so right. quickly. I mean, you know, like 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 running back decision, right? I mean, we do give running backs decision, you know, credit for being smarter than the the in the, 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 the way we look at it right. than most people do. That they're making decisions in the moment. I don't know the issue of making decisions. Hold on to that. I I I'm more like to think Jokic was was cognizant of going to give a little elbow to the fan. But I don't know that he knew it was, was Ishbia. Well, moment. you know, and, and, and Ken, by the way, the fan who touched him was not Ishbia. It was a, <laughs> it was it was another fan who reached over and shoved him and pushed him. Now that guy, unless he's like Ishbia's brother, that guy should be banned for, for you know for forever. For, for life. life. Let's ban it for life. Yeah, let's just ban him. I mean, you because he actually got involved. And you know, right. the thing is, man, like like he said, uh, and I think I think even in the press conference. Jokic got he he conflated Ishbia with the guy who pushed him. It was a guy who yeah. who who pushed him. And Ishbia give his credit. He played at Michigan State. I mean, he was a walk on, but he played. So he was he was a ball player. He knows better than that that stuff. You're right. I think it was just in the moment. And and like and one of his players of the Suns was like head over heels, <laughs> toppled over in the stand. It was just a very <laughs> which is what makes sports so great. Which is why people love to be. Right, there, like whether it's Spike Lee or Jack Nicholson, you know, it's like you go to see a, a play, right? Uh, you go to see Cleopatra or Othello, and you can't go unless you're like sort of in an audience. Sometimes with brothers, we kind of rush up to the audience, you know, rush up to, and you know, you can't rush up to the stage, say, no, no, you can't do that. Leave them alone. You know, where sports, <laughs> it's so like in the moment, you can actually feel you're a part of it. So. Uh, no. Well, well y'all, I'll, uh, I mean, Spike, Spike is our best example of, of that. <laughs> Spike, oh, yeah, Spike I, I, you are not I, playing tonight, Spike. Sit, stay in your seat. <laughs> that's not so my job. What, what comes out. I mean, you, 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 you do you have, I'm not going to press you on it, but, but. Oh, I'll it, tell you. It, 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 there'll not, be some punishment to, to Jokic, but, but Ishbia no, will be. Ishbia, the owner of the Phoenix not, is not going to get suspended or punished. Uh, I think the person that that fan who reached over is going to get slapped, you know, which you could almost argue is another form. You know, you're not going to hit Ishmael, you hit the other guy. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you ever come back again. <laughs> Let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> so All right, anyway. right, well, this is not the X's and O's show, so we, we won't go on any, any, any further with what, what's going on, on with that. But Bill, uh, it's been good uh, catching up and and having our, our education today, and and hopefully we can speak to to those issues with with a little bit more insight. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. All right, Bill. All right, thanks All a right. lot. Take care.